Welcome to another Fact of Fiction Friday. I am the guinea pig Christopher Macau. He is Professor Jason Parsons. And I have a nice, clean, fresh cut, high and tight, I nice, clean shave. I do too. He's bald, yeah. not me. Yeah. Today we have a good episode. We are talking about one of those big buzzwords out there. Bzzz. GMOs are bad for your health. Everywhere you're seeing, you go into the grocery store, we see non-GMO this, non-GMO that. GMO free water. Ooh. I didn't really know what a GMO was till recently, but I don't know what I was going to say, so I'll just pass it on Jason. Give me the time. Give me the time. All right. I got this. <laughs> the interesting thing is most people don't know what a GMO is either. And that's so as we go through this today, one of the things I love to do in these videos is to help to explain to people what's actually going on with something that they thought they understood, right? So let's dive into GMOs here. So GMO stands for genetically modified organism, genetically modified organism. So the interesting thing is GMOs are encapsulate a variety of different methods of modifying an organism. We're talking about animals and plants and bacteria and fungus and all kinds of stuff. So three basic ways that uh, GMOs work. There are selected breeding. So for example, um, I'm six foot four, my wife is six foot tall. If we had a baby together, there's a good chance that through selective purposeful breeding, we'd have a tall child together, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the same thing can be said of different animals out there, um, uh, plants, things like that. They, they, they find the best attributes of two and they bring them together to make a new one, the next evolution being a selectively bred, genetically modified organism. Mutagenics. Mutagenics basically is kind of like the Incredible Hulk, right? Uh, Bruce Banner is exposed with some gamma radiation and poof, he turns to a big angry green guy. Eh, it's not quite as dramatic as that. Mutagenics basically means exposing, uh, in this case, fruits and vegetables, plants, bacteria, things like that, to um, radiation, um, other chemicals, things that cause mutations in the genetic code. And uh, that's what mutagenics is. It's not as used for a lot of things. And then we have over here engineered uh, types of genetic modification. Engineered. GMOs are probably the ones that most people are concerned about. They don't realize it's the specific type, this engineering where they use um, you know, uh, electron microscopes and they use chemical cleaving and they actually pick out little pieces of the DNA and splice specific genes in and out. Use, there's this technology called CRISPR where they're very exacting with that. So this is the one that most people are concerned about where they think they're making Franken food, right? Mm -hmm. Franken food, like it's got bolts in its neck or something. Um, as opposed to selective breeding, which has been around for thousands of years. Um, and we'll talk a little more about GDT here, so it makes sense. But those are the three basic types of GMO, genetically modified. Before you move on, you were talking to me about uh, these blue bowls or blue something. Ah, yes, Please. yes, yes. Um, there's a type of uh, cow, and, and especially the, the male of the species of the cow, um, called a Belgian blue, right? Belgian blue. Google this uh, on your phone or your computer, wherever you're at right now. Belgian blue bowl. You can put that in. It's an alliteration, by the way. I like fun stuff like that. Yeah. Anyway, Belgian blue bowl has um, a genetic modification to it uh, where it is uh, got a gene missing. This gene deals with growing muscle. There's an actual gene inside of our bodies, just like inside of other animals, that stops you from growing muscles forever and ever and ever. So you just turn this giant Hulk looking thing, right? So this gene, if it's retarded, if it's pushed down to a lower level, or if it's completely removed, allows, in this case, that Belgian blue to grow to these huge, crazy proportions. It's just this one huge hulking muscle walking around. It's really crazy. So if you go on Google Images, it looks, look at it looks that, fake. It looks ridiculous. It looks totally fake. And that's, I think, when people think about this genetic engineering and the Franken food or Franken animals, right? That's kind of what they're thinking, but that's just incredibly rare. But that, and then those were, we didn't create those, did we? No, those were, uh, those were just sort of happen along. Uh, there is some cr uh, selective breeding where they do enhance that a little bit, but that was a, a genetic freak that happened, a mutagenic that happened of its own accord. Like, hey, why is this bull so muscular over here? They tested, found out that it was missing that gene, and poof, there it is. So it's, it's called the myostatin gene. Myo means muscle, statin means stops, so it stops the muscle from growing if you don't have that gene. And this is very much true in humans, too. Humans that have less of that myostatin gene can become more muscular just naturally, just standing around. I had to work for this book. This is all I have. I busted my butt for this, right? People that have more of the myostatin gene. <laughs> no, don't feel the point over here. <laughs> it's harder for them to get as much muscle because that gene is actually retarding the growth of muscle. So it's, we all have it in our bodies and at different amounts of it based on your genetics determine how much uh, predisposition you have to having muscle on your body. So it's an interesting thing. Bully whippet dogs also have this. You can Google that one too. Google that on your uh, computer there. Bully whippet. Really weird looking things. Yeah, go on that computer. It's weird. 
So um, there's a lot of GMOs out there. People don't seem to realize this, that fruits and vegetables, things we talk about, the bully whippet dogs, things like that, it's a very tiny, tiny little fraction. 0.1% of all the GMOs are the ones we're gonna to discuss today. 99.9% .9 of all GMOs, the majority of this beautiful pie graph, it almost looks like Pac-Man, his mouth closed over here. Um, most GMOs deal with bacteria and viruses, and they're in the uh, uh, scientific community used for studying disease management and things of that nature. They're stuff we never hear about, don't even know about, because it's not out in the popular field like this. So uh, exactly. what most people know about for GMOs, they're talking about you know corn, tomatoes, things you can see at the grocery store, stuff that's on the Facebook or popping around, or made up things like you know fish with five eyeballs or weird things. Like A lot that. of stuff that's increased our life expectancy. All good stuff, and so, all the vast majority of the GMOs out there are meant to help us. And some of these things you can see, we'll talk about here in just a second, are really good things. That you are already using GMOs, you just don't know it, right? Um, interesting enough, thousands of studies have been done on genetic modified organisms. In this case, you have to put down 1,500 plus studies out there. And across the board, they say that they're safe. GMOs are safe, safe, safe. Now, opponents of GMOs will say, but those studies don't say it's 100% guaranteed, perfectly safe. The reality is nothing is. Scientists will tell you right now that nothing, no substance anywhere in the world is 100% guaranteed to be safe. If you don't get enough oxygen, you'll die. If you have too much oxygen, you'll die. You don't have enough water, you'll die. You have too much water, you'll die. So is oxygen bad for you? Is water bad for you? No. The reality is, as we've said many times before, it's the dose that makes the poison. And in the case of GMOs, the studies unanimously across the board say that they're safe for us. So being worried because we can't say the words absolutely perfect, 100% safe, nothing is. So you're not gonna ever get that answer from an actual scientist. So saying because they don't put those words out there that they're bad, eh, you're, you're kind of running to the wrong direction. So let's relax a little bit. Back to the good stuff about what GMOs have done. So again, the vast majority of GMO usage is on bacteria and viruses and even mice and studies, things like that, to try and find ways to solve disease and extend life, longevity in humans and things of that nature, increase food opportunity, all those studies and stuff out there have brought us some great advancements, right? A lot of us are alive past the age of 30 because of vaccinations that are built off of GMOs and other such things. Uh, in America, a lot of people have diabetes, type 1, type 2 diabetes. And if you're insulin dependent, you need to take insulin shots. Yay, you, you're using a GMO, right? Because insulin is created through a bacteria that's genetically modified. Lucky us, we have that opportunity. Multiple sclerosis people that have multiple sclerosis have to use interferon. Interferon, made with a GMO. Cancer, people that have cancer deals with uh, degradation of their bone marrow. If they have radiation therapy or chemotherapy, some of leukemia that mess up their bone marrow. Your bone marrow is where you grow a lot of your red blood cells. If you have that messed up through radiation, chemo, and or leukemia, whatever the issue is, you get EPO given to you. EPO, erythropoietin, is a medication used to increase red blood cells. A lot of people may have heard of EPO because like Lance Armstrong, the cyclist, a lot of athletes use EPO because increasing red blood cells means you can transport more oxygen, means you can work harder for longer. A lot of athletes cheat and use that stuff. I don't recommend doing that. That could be a bad problem. You also can have G-SF. I was gonna memorize what that means. And I forgot it. I tried it for like 20 minutes before this. <laughs> I still can't remember what the hell it stands for, but that's another medication that is GMO made. If you are lactose intolerant, you drink a lot of milk, you like ice cream, like yogurt, but it isn't like you, bad things happen back here. When you have that stuff, you're probably not producing as much lactase, the enzyme that helps your body to break down lactose, the sugar found inside milk products. So you can get that over the counter, you get that lactate stuff, those pills you take to help you process that sugar. That lactase came from a GMO. Hmm, GMOs are good. In reality, they help a lot of stuff around us that we just take for granted. We didn't even know what was happening. And this is a short, short list here. So, some of the more common things people see when it comes to GMO, where they, they see and they read about and they talk about GMOs, especially as we said, like at the grocery store, you walk through and you see all these labels about non-GMO, non-GMO. It's, it's, it's on everything. The reality is there's only a couple total crops in all of our food supply that even is GMO. So, so most, most of the food products we're already in store yeah. our whole lives were already non-GMO. It's already non-GMO. Non just putting it on there because of four things that... Because it's a buzzword, like you said at the very beginning of this video, it's a buzzword. People talk about it. Ah, it's so bad. Why is it so bad? And most people don't know what the hell they're talking about. Ignorance is bliss, or in this case, ignorance is fear. So that's what we're here to try and help answer some questions you might not have even known you had. Things like corn, right? Corn, tomatoes, carrots, yummy fried egg over here. Corn, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, was a little, little green thing about the size of my pinky, little tiny little thing with a couple kernels in it. Not very uh, valuable, not a lot of food opportunity from that. So through selective breeding, 
people have over time crossbred the larger one with the larger one with the larger one until we have these really large, robust pieces. In this case, white corn. Chris didn't want to fill in the yellow on each of those kernels, so we went with white corn. Someone took my yellow marker with the red marker. We got a thief around here. It's really weird. Oh, I got a pink tomato. <laughs> <laughs> so the corn we eat today. It's not genetically engineered. <laughs> <laughs> the tomato is definitely not. <laughs> the corn we have today, not only is it larger with more sugar, so it tastes better from the genetic modification, but also the perfect formation is based off of genetically modified. Some of these crossbreeding techniques are not just for the nutritional value of sugar content, vitamins, minerals, enzymes, things like that, but also for visual appeal. The reality is, especially here in America, we're super spoiled. Not only do we have way more food available than we probably need, but we're so finicky and picky about it, we want to look perfect also. And a big part of the GMO process, specifically that selective breeding, is to make, in this case, tomatoes that are beautiful globes of soft, perfectness with very minimal seeds in them, right? They don't want seeds in their tomatoes. They want to be seedless as much as possible. You've probably seen sometimes you go to the grocery store, and it'll be like one little section by the tomatoes that has some heirloom tomatoes, and they look like they're little Franken foods over there. Like, what's wrong with those? And that's how tomatoes normally are if we don't use selective breeding to get the perfect globes. So that's what's going on with those. Carrots. Carrots, many, many, many moons ago, back to the 17th century, the Dutch started breeding carrots that used to be, again, the size of my pinky, tiny little things that were like yellow and some of them were red, kind of bitter, not very sweet. And the crossbreeding with the best selective forms have made these big, beautiful, orange, sweet, sugar-filled carrots that we know today. Very different than they used to be hundreds of years ago. And then of course over here, eggs, we don't have GMO eggs per se, but we do have GMO chickens for two main reasons. The selective breeding that we do with chickens, we wanna have chickens with big, luscious, big breasts the muscle in the chest, of course, is what I'm talking about because that's the most common meat that we eat from chickens. So the larger they are, the more you can make money from it. That's one reason. And of course, the eggs that chickens produce as well. We have done selective breeding to find the eggs, the chickens that produce the most eggs. An average chicken, you know, a couple hundred years ago, only made 20, 30, 40 eggs a year. Now they're pumping out 300 eggs a year. Mm. Is what it is ethically, but the reality is that's what the crossbreeding was done for, to find the biggest breasts and the most eggs coming out of those chickens. So they're optimal for our food supply. So most, most of the, uh, when it comes to food products, it's been a lot of crossbreeding as far as the GMO goes, not engineered or even Correct. The, you, you, these, I think these are what people are scared off of. People are scared of the mutagenics and the engineering, not as much the, the selective breeding. But reality is for most of our foods that are GMOs, which is most foods are GMO, they're modified. I just told you these ones are modified. And guess what? Carrots are not listed as GMOs when you go to the grocery store, but they are GMO'd. They're selective breeding modified. And then people argue and say, well, that's not what I'm talking about, Jason. I'm talking about when humans interfere and start messing with the genes. Okay, well, technically we are with the breeding up here, but I'll push that aside. Most people are concerned with mutagenics and the engineered foods. So there are engineered corn. BT corn is a type of corn that's been engineered, spliced with genes that actually are pesticides that kill off the caterpillars that go eat that corn normally. Right? So that's, that is a, a, a registered GMO, in this case, engineered type of corn. But there's only a handful, and we're talking less than I have fingers, of total GMO, specifically engineered GMO foods available in the United States, less than 10. Right? So there's only a few total, not a huge number like people seem to think. Comma, but most of the fruits and vegetables we have available today have been selectively bred. Right? Something people don't know, kale, spinach, um, broccoli and cauliflower. Did you know that those are all the same plant? Those sound super. It's all the same plant. Is it? Yes. Kale? It's all the same plant. <laughs> They've been GMO'd, bred, bred for the flowering portion of it or the leaf portion of that same plant to get the benefit out of it. It's all the same thing. Google that. Don't believe me. Never believe anything Jason says. Google me. Check it. Fact check me. Those are superfoods, aren't they? Superfoods. I think we have one of those coming next. We should probably make a video on superfoods because unless they're wearing a cape, I don't think it's a superfood. Huh. Anyway, so pluses and minuses of GMOs. Now, we're going to talk about the pluses specifically because I already talked about some pluses of these things. Delicious, tasty, more of it, all kinds of good things from the selective breeding process. Let's talk about the engineered foods. There's got to be some positives, those to overwhelm the people that are saying, oh, they're all bad. So some of the great things about genetically engineered organisms, right, where they use like CRISPR or the technologies to just splice specific genes. Well, it's very exact. Right? From mutagenics, or even just regular selective breeding, when you put two plants together and you breed those, or you take two humans and put them together, my wife is tall, I'm tall, we come together, we can have a short child. Because it's kind of like this, we're crossing our fingers and hoping certain genes will cross over from that breeding like that, but the reality is it's not exact. 
However, when we do it in an engineered fashion, it's very exact. You can modify a single or just a couple genes to get the exact result that you're looking for, such as with that BT corn that we were talking about, right? Exactly the genes you want, exactly the response you want. It's very predictable and it's replicatable. Now this is very important because it's not a crapshoot. Scientists don't like to cross their fingers and hope when it comes to genetic editing, when they're doing this genetically engineered foods, because they're trying to get a specific thing and be able to do it over and over and over again so it's not you know, a guesswork type of situation. That's why I got a little computer down here. Negatives of genetic engineering, the other side of the coin there, um, there's this eternal war going on. I mentioned earlier the BT corn, so the specific GMO corn that's been engineered to have that pesticide built in that kills the worms, the uh, caterpillars that come up trying to eat that corn. Well, the great thing is, is that means we get a higher yield in the crop. Those caterpillars aren't eating the corn, so we get to harvest all that corn, we can feed more people, awesome, that's a great thing. The problem is that super strain of corn means that those caterpillars have nothing to eat, those caterpillars die, they don't eat that corn, they go somewhere else, there's less of them, whatever's going on there, we've killed those off, and now some other creature comes along to take that place in the ecosystem that was already occupied by that caterpillar, and an alien invasion happens. <laughs> Some of the a goat comes in and eats what the, the caterpillars want. It's weird. So we're kind of messing with the ecosystems by us interjecting this genetically engineered food in there. It starts to change things. So a lot of people complain it's like we're playing the hand of God over here by engineering things of this nature. The reality is there's always things changing across all ecosystems everywhere. Just like the weather comes through and changes things. Uh, hurricanes here in South Florida come through and mess up the shoreline and screw up where the turtles were laying their eggs. And man, was that something we caused? It was just the weather. And things are always changing. The only thing we know is absolute is everything will change. Yes, we have a hand in what's going on with the foods we're trying to feed humans with. In the case of these super strains that we've created with GMOs and these alien invasions of new predators, if you will, coming in trying to take the place of the ones that we got rid of, it's just part of the game. It is what it is. You want to call it bad? That's your choice. Do that's an ethics thing more than anything. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, over here, this last bullet point we have here, I really love that Chris has amazing artwork capabilities. I mess up stick figures. This dude busted out a stormtrooper over here. Genetic erosion is another negative, if you will, for GMOs. And what that means is, in order for a genetically modified food to get to the table, before it gets to the marketplace, it has to go through years and years and years of very stringent regulation and testing to guarantee it's not gonna mess up the ecology around the world or hurt humans. Remember those, all those studies we talked about over here in the studies? It has to go through study after study after study and peer reviewed literature and all this stuff to prove it's not gonna mess people up or hurt the ecology, right? So sometimes it's up to 12 years of jumping through hoops and making sure that this GMO is on the up and up. It's gonna be a good thing and have a positive net value as opposed to negative net value. And so all that time, all the things they have to do is one of the things they have to make sure happens. And again, I sit over here and this is exact with this genetic engineering. Well, the interesting thing is that, like say for example, that BT corn, all the BT corn has to be genetically identical. It has to be like a clone, if you will. All of it identical across the board. There's no mutations allowed. It has to be exact. They wanted the exact thing to happen with the genetic expression of that corn. Well, if it's all a clone, like in the Clone Wars, hence the stormtroopers over here that Chris drove, that uh, identical nature of those genes means that there's no gene pool. The gene pool is dried up, it's one gene, one, uh, one DNA, and that's it. It's no, there's no variances. And that kind of goes against nature, if you will. Nature is about variety, it's about spontaneous mutation, right? Spontaneously mutating out there, that's how evolution occurs. A spontaneous mutation and things branch off, whichever one survives, that's the one that survives, right? Well, with our GMO foods that have uh, passed all those rigor, they have to be so strict with being exactly the same thing across the board, duplicatable. That also means there's no depth to the gene pool. So that's, that's, a, that's a challenge point also with GMOs. So something for us to look at as we continue for the next 10, 50, 100 years of using these GMOs to continue to evaluate and see how it's gonna impact the world in the future. Up you to think, this point, it's pretty safe. You think George Lucas came up with the Clone Wars idea from studying most, GMOs? Most likely, it was, it was probably from corn. Probably from corn, that's what he did. No, I have no idea. He's way more creative than I am, that's for sure. So, uh, lots of sciencey stuff today. Lots of big words. I couldn't even remember what this one meant over here. It's such big words, and that's rare for Jason. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I had some cue cards over there. That's why she did that. If I was really yeah. smart, I'd have had a little board behind we'll the We'll get camera. Justin next week to hold up yeah. on He's not doing anything Teleprompter or something for us. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get our technology on point. Anyway, point is, understand what a GMO is. Most of it, great stuff. You're using it, you're taking it. It's in your life already. 
the stuff down here we're talking about, right? That's the insulin, you know, the uh, lacto lactase that you take, medications for cancer, all kinds. There's a whole laundry list of things that are, we're taking I mean, on a daily for basis. For the most part, uh, all medications are... The vast majority. GMO, right? The vast majority of medications. Talking about all natural. The ones that came from that from, from bacteria or viral basis, right? Mm -hmm. Vaccines, all those, those are all genetic modified, all vaccines, all those things, right? So they're good. They're meant to help you. We live some as people, long as we do. Some people think they're bad. Well, yeah, some people Only don't want to live natural medicine and stuff yeah, like that. We don't talk about those people. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I thought that was a very interesting episode. Uh, again, I didn't really know what a GMO was until it was explained to me earlier. Well, most people don't. Most right. It's not a bad thing. Remember, I'm well, you see, you see it all over the store. Non-GMO. Like, what the, what the heck is GMO? Is it, are they injecting something crazy in there? Are they gonna? What's this bad thing that's in all these products? But it's not. Keyword: What you just said. What's this bad thing? There's a lot of fear mongering when it comes to things that people don't understand. A big part of what we try to do with our Fact or Fiction Friday videos is give you some information that you can then choose to use of your own accord. Make your own decisions. Take action in your life if you want to with more information. And in an absence of information, it's real hard for us to figure out what's right and what's wrong. We just hear this fear mongering happening all the time, especially on social media. It's just, it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And these buzzwords like GMOs or other stuff we've talked about in the past, you can't make a decision for yourself if you don't really have information. So that's what we're here to do is to share with you some information so you can make a better decision. We hope that you found this interesting. That's it for this episode, but we got something super for you next week. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the guinea pig. He's a professor signing off.